On this day in 1955, Emmett, Doc Brown, voice company, the idea for Lux Capacitor. Welcome to my look at Back to the Future. While many doubted this film with their work, it ended up being the most successful in 1985, becoming a cultural touchstone with its two sequels, which we'll get to in the coming months. So let's get started. We open Doc's laboratory, where the young teenager might have fly, being like Roger Fox, Darwin Roll, comes aboard school, starts to take care of his dark eye sign. This is when he blows the speakers out of the amplifier with a single guitar chord. He gets a call from the doc, who tells him to meet at 25 mile 115 for an experiment. All the clocks go at the same time, Marty finds out he's late for school. Yeah, the time changes tonight, that's gonna wreak havoc on my sleep schedule. Then quickly the skateboards out of the lab, and Marty skits on the back of some cars to get to class to Huey Lewis and the news to Power of Love. Much like the journey, honey, he takes over the trilogy, his methods take mega time. Aim as we get a good look at the cars, people in senior fictional hell of California. And basically, it's a movie which is a way of saying Welcome to 1985. His girlfriend, Jennifer Parker, played Leah Thompson, tries to sneak him in, but they caught anyone but Principal Strickland. Despite being told that no more flight ever amounted to anything in the Hill Valley, Marty is undeterred as his endeavors in devotion to Doc. He is a kid of Albany instead of in some time or some way. Later that day, Marty's doing a flyer contributing to save Hill Valley Clock Tower, and we are introduced to Biff Tannen, who regularly antagonizes Joe McFly. Play a Crispin Lover. It also turns out the characters based on one of the executives that gave Armas and Mickers and Mark Gilhart time about the film. One of them even said, Well, if I don't turn around, we just don't work, they just don't work. It took the intervention of Steven Spur to convince him otherwise. That night at dinner, Lily McFly calls story on how she and George met, setting these for first film spots. Marty goes to the mall at 1.15 as promised, and we formally introduce a dog paper Crispin Lover as well as Lily and Time Machine. Well, the car may have had its share of problems, and thanks to this film, it's become one of the most recognized movie and TV cars ever, it's definitely one of my favorites. As for the license plate, hey, having more than one character in California, what plates normally do, it's probably a vanity plate, which has a bit more leeway. Anyway, the car tells the time when it hits 88 miles per hour, it's supposed to answer back in time in a single minute. So Doc goes back, decides to go back to the day he invented false capacitor, November 5th, 1955. He was hanging a clock Hong from his toilet, which fell his head on the sink, and came up with the idea when he came to. The 50s were also a very different time, and there's a standing area where a pine tree farm once did, owned by a man named Peabody. Doc was also acquired for the tiny and dark power of the time circuits, which is a constant will be a national set of. It's necessary to generate the 1.21 gigawatts of power to initiate time travel. Unfortunately, the Libyans come calling, with Doc being shot in the process. Marty manages to elude them, but sent back to 1955 nearly escaping P-Bot's from destroying one of the highest uh, pines as he flies the scene. Marty quickly discovers that World 1955 Hill Valley is not a very different one where he knows, and has trouble for the end. However, he does encourage a bus boy that recognizes his mirror and his, his time to follow his dreams, names to disapprove of his superior. As for this plot point, others involve Marty's in history. I don't know who's supposed to do this. He decides to manage to find the dog, uh, but runs into trouble when he almost gains affection of his future mother. Yeah, this subplot is the catalyst that causes Disney to turn down the movie when it was pictured to them. Well, not given how they did make out like Vance, who Vance Rabbit, and the character of Jessica Rabbit was the same director. Also, every other studio turned down the film for not being central enough for them. Also, even though most of the period on the century are probably very accurate, with the episode show classic Honeymooners that's playing in Animal Space, one year until the summer of the first year, more than a month after the movie is set. Oops. Anyway, Marty goes to see the dog, and quests his hope, leading to a hilarious reaction that Reagan is president in 1985. Ronald Reagan? The actor? And who's vice president? Jerry Lewis? Yet, when Marty details the events of the dark experiment, as well as what happened with his father, they realize what needs to be done. They need to get a time machine working again, and make sure his parents meet at the Enchantment of Sea Dance, and can show his family's future and go back to his own time. So, Saturday night at 10 4 p.m. will be when the lightning storm needed to generate power occurs, and must make sure everything is done by then. Marty, in the alias of Calvin Klein, not only encourages George to go to Dance with the Rain, but also gets signs for the stories working unpublished one day. Biff also makes a move on the rain, and while Biff isn't very smart, he's very boorish, eager to pick fights with those things beneath him. Marty also gets more encouragement, and in the case of Darth Vader, an extraterrestrial on planet Vulcan. Nice. Yet, when he tries to meet Lorraine at the cafe, Biff attacks George, but Calvin spins an action with a makeshift skateboard, and ending with Biff crashes a car in lower the manure. While the journey back and meeting has an considerable risk, they cannot afford to be doubtful, and so they go ahead with their plans by the danger involved. 
So my advisors are planned to get George and Lorraine together and it involves me in the personal with Lorraine to boost George's self-confidence. It also leaves an over dark in the future to one how about what happens in 1985. Every Biff catches wind of this and tries to make a move on Lorraine himself. At this moment, Biff and George defends his and Lane's and loyally clobbers Biff. Yeah, because Biff is goons locked Marty in the trunk of the band's car, he has found the guitarist who injured his hand trying to get him out. This has added to Marvin Barry causing his calling his cousin Chuck to give him the inspiration for music of the final generation. As time runs out, the DeLorean is sent back to 1985, and the sequence is heavily influenced by the classic Safety Last. The same movie, feel that Doc had more of his lab have in near the beginning of the film. Upon his return, Marty finds his life and those other spins for the improvement. George not being successful, author and Biff not being a meek automobile detailer. He also finds Jennifer and the new truck he wanted waiting for him at home, and the close Doc inviting him back to the future to help their children. This may be one of the most organic sequels I've ever seen. One that needs to open, but also gives enough to imagine what happens on your own. Even after more than 30 years, the movie remains one of my favorites from that time. A film that made doubt work became the biggest hit in 1985, making it with $210 million in the U.S. and $380 million worldwide in $19 million budget. I have seen all these movies, movies many times since I was nine, and I honestly can't wait to tell you more when the time comes. With likable characters, a unique premise, as they were parodied more many times over the years, a host of innovative visuals, it's a movie I very rarely pass up an opportunity to watch. I'm very glad I had Tuesday to talk about it. By Wayne, three and a half stars out of four. I will be covering part two in December, with part, and I'll be talking about part three a lot of time on the 25th birthday in January 2017. See you, Space Cowboy. Mm -hmm.